And now I'd like to introduce you to our featured speaker. Bobby J. Calder of Northwestern University is Professor of Marketing and Professor of Psychology at the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern. He's also a professor of journalism in the Medill School of Journalism there. He's currently chair of the ISO International Committee on Brand Evaluation and has served as the chair of the Kellogg Marketing Department. His work is primarily in the areas of brand strategy, media marketing, and the psychology of consumer behavior. He's taught at Wharton and the University of Illinois and been a consultant for Booz Allen and Hamilton. Uh, he's been a consultant to many individual companies, just to name a few, Coca-Cola, General Electric, uh, Samsung, and also consulted for nonprofit organizations such as uh, Agencies of the Government, United Way, and so forth. And he's authored books on topics related to this, to media and marketing. With that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Bobby for his presentation. Thank you, Gordon. Let me say at the outset that uh, I think the uh, topic we have today, content marketing, is really really belongs at the forefront of marketing thinking uh, today and represents something of a sea change in that thinking. Um, right up there with, with things like big data, customization, personalization, those kinds of things. I think content marketing re really represents a really major new way of creating value for brands and, and as a potential solution to some of the issues facing marketing we'll, we'll talk about today. Um, of course, with anything that represents change, you get a certain amount of confusion uh, as well as opportunity. So we'll talk about that a little bit today as well to try to bring some clarity to what content marketing is all about. Um, but I, I'd really like to begin by reinforcing that it's not just another buzzword uh, that you know, marketers love to add something before the word marketing and just add it on to the list of uh, things we talk about. Um, if you uh, look at the typical marketing organization of the past, it looks something like uh, this traditionally in terms of basically a 4P type of organization that's what we've come to, to know and uh, to love. But if you actually look at uh, the way organizations are evolving, you see something today that looks more like this. Um, uh, this is actually uh, the Tom O'Toole's chart uh, from, uh, he's a former CMO of uh, United Airlines. So this probably looks pretty much like the organization uh, of United Airlines. But you see the, the list of things just tacked on to the, to the classic marketing organization. Um, and content marketing just shows up as one of those. And every, everything uh, gets increasingly divided attention and resources in this kind of approach. So what I want to argue is that content marketing really belongs to a more central role and not just an add-on to the list of marketing activities. Um, so to begin, let's take a look at bigger picture questions. Uh, what I'd like to address today are things like uh, what is really new about content marketing? Why does it represent, uh, at least in my mind, more of a sea change idea? Uh, why it's really an alternative to advertising and, and, and should be thought of that way in terms of its important, importance to marketing? And uh, really, how does it actually work from a consumer psychology point of view? How can you really expect content to create value in a way that's perhaps different, and I will argue is different from, from advertising? Um, so these are the issues we'll talk about. Let's begin with the basic question of what is content marketing anyway? Uh, to the extent that um, content marketing is discussed, uh, everybody has been trying to define it for at least three or four years now, and the, the definitions range quite a bit, uh, but these are probably pretty typical, uh, thoughtful kinds of definitions, and if you look at them, you, what you see is um, uh, they're really all about the notion that uh, um, there's two aspects to this. One is you're actually marketing with content. And that may sound like a, um, 
a truism to some extent, but uh, I think we'll see from the conversation today that that's really a, a real difference, that you're actually using content, uh, media content, to actually market with it. And the second thing you see is the notion that content can really uh, is really valued by, by consumers, and the word generally associated with that is engaged. If you just think about the uh, the last TV series you binged on or whatever, that's that's really the the power of media and media content, and the notion is to harness that kind of engagement in the service of building brands. The other way to come at this is on the theory that uh, you know, let's just look at what is being done. Uh, here's a fairly pedestrian but a typical, I think, example of actual content marketing. This is the uh, uh, the Porsche automobile, and uh, it's the the media is the Atlantic Magazine. Uh, but they've created a article essentially for Porsche. They call it sponsored content to sort of designate that it's not uh, uh, exactly the same as their usual content, but for the world it is it is content of the sort that appears in the magazine. And essentially, uh, as such, it's a uh, simply a story about uh, riding in, in a Porsche. And in, in this case, they've uh, attached uh, physiological measures to people, so it's sort of a science story. But uh, it's uh, also about the, the, the relevance of uh, the brand as a thrilling experience that can actually be measured in terms of physiology. So it's content and uh, presumably engaging content. So this is what we're talking about. Now, uh, I hasten to add, there's all kinds of terminology sprouting up around this kind of thing. Uh, these are just some of the, uh, the words that are banded about these days. Uh, that branded content has the connotation of uh, content that's created originating with the brand. Uh, sponsored content is more the idea that someone like the Atlantic, some media property, creates the content for the brand. Native advertising has uh, all kinds of uh, uh, things associated with it, uh, but basically the idea is that it's advertising that's somehow uh, native to the media it appears in, or at least it appears to be native to the, to the media it appears in. Brand journalism is a notion that you hire a journalist who actually does uh, 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 independent reporting on the brand. Uh, branded entertainment is uh, the notion of working with a perhaps a movie, movie studio to, to make uh, 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 a piece of entertainment that, that, that relates to the brand. But all of these, my point is all of these are really content marketing. They're all versions of the same idea. And I don't think we should be too keen on, on splitting uh, minor distinctions among them. It's an evolving area, and you see a lot of variety. But when it comes down to it, it's, it's all with the same idea of using media content to actually create brand value. So I'll, I'll offer up the following definitions, and, and maybe we can get some comments on it from, uh, from, from the participants. But this is my sort of rough and ready, simple definition of content marketing. It really is using information, I'll say journalistic type of information, or entertainment uh, as content, uh, which can be user generated, but content that has as an added purpose uh, the creation of a brand value. As such, uh, it's not different from other media content, except that the purpose is to take some of the engagement inherent in media content and, and associate that with the, the brand. If you want to picture it, it's really the coming together of media and brand to create content together. That's, I would take it as the essence of, of, of the idea. Um, it can be take a, a, a big form or it can, can be done in a smaller kind of way as with the, uh, the Porsche example. 
you take a Pepsi, for example, you can create your own movie studio, uh, essentially, and develop a full-length movie, which you uh, uh, expect to, uh, to make some money off of as well as be a marketing vehicle in itself. So it, it can be big, it can be small, but it always has this essence to it of creating media content that um, involves the brand in such a way that the brand benefits from the engagement of the media content. So with that said, let's turn to the question of why should you think of content marketing as something that's different and, and, and an alternative, if you will, to relying on conventional advertising? Well, the short answer to that is the, the kind of problems that um, we all know are facing conventional advertising as it's come to be uh, uh, um, used over the last century in marketing. There's obvious things such as the growth of product parity between between brands. It's harder to maintain a, a actual uh, product advantage per se. Online distribution is evened out uh, differences in distribution and, and getting information about a product across. And there's simply the thought that um, uh, there's so many brands out there uh, that you can like and you'd be perfectly justified in liking. Um, you just can't buy all the things you like. So uh, this sort of parity and, and, and liking of brands as well as product parity. And then on the advertising side, of course, uh, there's the obvious clutter factor, uh, the ad blocking and avoidance. Uh, something like one in ten consumers in the U.S. use as ad blockers these days. Um, one in four in Europe. Um, so it's a major kind of uh, uh, obstacle to advertising, uh, including uh, growing, growing avoidance and skepticism about ads. Uh, and, of course, there's audience fragmentation and the disruption of television, and the list goes on and on, on of, of disruptors uh, uh, to advertising as we know it, everything from mass mobile and finding a way to, to introduce ads into that to cord cutting and, 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 and endless social media and millions of maps and video games that, that compete for people's attention, not to mention podcasts and selfies and Fitbit-type self-quantification, on and on, texting. So if you stand back and look at the uh, just the sheer environment of advertising, you realize that um, it's it's very very crowded, and and to ask for people's attention in that kind of environment is to ask much more than than to do that in 1950 or 1940 or 1980 even. Now that said, it is the case that there's a lot of money associated with advertising, you know, but probably about a trillion dollars worldwide, and that money is not going away. And people will continue to spend it as, as long as there's no other solution. So what I'm arguing is that there is a, a real alternative to advertising uh, that maybe it's not a replacement, but something that really represents an opportunity for more effective brand building. So that's part of the case uh, for content marketing. Uh, more the negative case, if you will. Let's look at the uh, positive case. And to do that, I thought it would be useful to go back to just the basics of advertising as a model. Advertising has become so ubiquitous in marketing thinking that I don't think we often realize that it's a particular specific model of, of trying to build brand value. So let's take a step back and look at that, if you will. Um, the conventional approach to advertising really says, look, a, a company uh, has a brand, and what they do with that, to build that brand is they try to persuade consumers that it has a specific benefit. And once they decide on the, the brand benefit that they want to position on, they give that brief to an advertising agency uh, who is responsible for uh, creating a persuasive message uh, in a creative kind of way, more or less, uh, 
could be pretty direct or it could be pretty fanciful, but pretty directly they turn that uh, 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 benefit into a message that persuades, is designed to persuade consumers that the brand indeed delivers that benefit. And then that ad message is uh, um, uh, produced and, 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 and distributed through, through media. Now, just to be absolutely concrete here, I have a little example for you. Um, this is a very successful product, interestingly enough. Uh, the idea, uh, the benefit is that you can have your cheese and eat it too. Uh, or have your cheese and, and, and less cheese and still enjoy it, if you will. And the brand benefit is expressed in a positioning statement and, as I was saying, turned into an ad that demonstrates very uh, 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 practically that this is indeed a thin piece of cheese, but it's still a good piece of cheese. Uh, you don't have to give up cheese for your sandwich uh, because the Sargento folks make high-quality cheese that even in a small slice delivers a, a good taste experience. So that's the process we've come to, to know and, and think is almost uh, uh, God-given. And of course, what happens with that ad, classically, is that it's uh, uh, put on one or more types of media uh, that have an audience. And we try to deliver a certain reach, number of people with a certain frequency, and given that objective is uh, achieved, then, then we have a, an effective advertising campaign. Now, my point is this. Think about the role of the media in this traditional advertising model. Uh, you have a media company who produces content, either information, journalistic, or entertainment. Um, and that content attracts an audience. Um, the audience comes for the content. The value for the audience is in the content. Um, what the conventional advertising model says is that you can take that audience who's come for the content and and expose the their their attention, um, expose them to the ad, and, and by really forcing their attention to the ad, based on their receptivity to the content. So the content is the key, but the advertising message is external to that content, and indeed, in the the uh, the uh, classic world of advertising. You even think of this as having a, a wall, as a phrase people have actually used in a lot of media environments between the content and the advertising message. Now, of course, that has always been um, honored in the breach as a rule, uh, but always with the that being the exception to the rule, the norm has been to really see advertising as really separate from content as a separate kind of, of process, if you will. Advertising is persuasion, content is information and entertainment, and to the extent the two are related, it's only because we can force attention by virtue of the content. Now, the reason i going through all this is that I think you can see that um, that that's not making full use of content. Yeah, it's no, uh, it's not nothing that uh, you can attract an audience and hold and get attention by virtue of uh, their 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 receptivity to to content. It's not making any other use of content. It's just saying if we can get people to hold still, we can uh, we've got an opportunity to persuade them. So. The question becomes, can we do more with content? If we really begin to use the content itself for marketing purposes, can we go beyond this persuasion model to do something different? Which comes to the question of, well, how can com consumers be affected by content in a way that translates into brand value? Uh, so let me give you my thoughts about how that plausibly uh, can happen. And to do that, I'll go back 
uh, to a little study that uh, uh, I was involved in, I think, uh, around 2007 or so. Uh, at the time, this was uh, uh, before there was really a lot of talk about content marketing or even native advertising. But the thought was this. Uh, in the classic advertising model, we just assume that the media really doesn't mo matter for an ad. Uh, maybe there was uh, some uh, affinity that would creep into an ad agency's thinking about putting an ad in a certain uh, medium such as Vogue. But really, uh, the agencies are pretty agnostic. If, if you can meet your reach and frequency requirements, uh, you go with the, the lowest uh, 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 costs for doing that, and the, the content really is uh, essentially immaterial. So the thought behind this study was to say, look, this, this may not be the case. This may just be an artifact of uh, an assumption that's been made about advertising, and, and content may be more important even in an advertising context than, than we've acknowledged. So the notion was, let's take a medium and uh, uh, and, and think about what really attracts the consumer to it. And it, it, when you do that, you begin to realize that it's really about larger things in life. Uh, I'll say life goals and, and things that relate to social values that the consumer has. And that really any piece of content that really is successful will, will really relate to these kinds of things, either something that allows people to do something in their life from a utilitarian or informational point of view that they might not have known to do before, uh, if it's uh, nothing but baking a cake or something, or it relates to self-improvement, how to exercise better, improve your health, uh, become more sophisticated in some way perhaps a, a value or goal around relationships or social connection or just the uh, intrinsic uh, involvement that you get with media in terms of really just getting caught up in a story and sort of losing your, your own concerns of the day for, for, for a period of time. If that's really what successful media content is all about and, 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 and these are the kinds of things which produce uh, what I'm referring to and the literature refers to as engagement, then why, why wouldn't that be able to transfer to a brand, even, even, even a brand represented seemingly externally by, by an ad? So what we did was to place a very simple ad. Uh, don't laugh. This is a limit of my Photoshop ability. Uh, we created this ad. Uh, I couldn't get the name on the, the actual product, but as close as I could come. A uh, simple ad for uh, a bottle of water. Uh, decide for yourself, uh, uh, water is water, and this is just uh, uh, okay water. So not meant to be extremely persuasive, um, just kind of a um, run-of-the-mill ad, if, if you will. But what we did was we exposed people to this ad either in a media context that was high on various forms of engagement or a control group or uh, a content that was low on this kind of engagement. And we did this across magazines, uh, newspapers, uh, online kinds of uh, media. Uh, even eventually we did it with uh, television, uh, not, not with this particular ad, but with a, the equivalent. And always we see the same thing. Uh, this is just one, uh, one example. Uh, uh, if you look at any, any of these types of engaging experiences that you could highlight in a given piece of content, say social, utilitarian, invariably if you test the ad in that environment, that context, if you will, versus uh, uh, a less engaging environment in any of these ways, uh, the ad doesn't perform as well, uh, uh, typical copy testing kinds of, of measures. And if you look over different kinds of engagement, just at the total engagement, uh, uh, you, you get the same kind of effect. 
So that really convinced me early on, and I think it's a good example uh, to this day, of how content can really transfer to a brand if uh, the content really has any of these kinds of life goals, social value, larger than um, uh, any specific product could hope to be in people's lives, it has any of that kind of relevance, um, people are engaged, and that engagement can transfer to, to the product, not just in a context native advertising effect on the, uh, on the uh, uh, of, of an ad, but even more so if the, the brand is somehow grounded in the content in a more intrinsic kind of way. So I would point to things like this, uh, which is a piece of content marketing from Coca-Cola. Um, it turns out the Chinese have an obsession with Warren Buffett um, uh, and love to talk about Warren Buffett. So here you have a... Um, essentially a magazine piece, and Coca-Cola has converted its corporate website in every country into a magazine essentially called the Coca-Cola Journal, and they run stories uh, like this uh, 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 featuring some of their own marketing activities, but, but uh, uh, sometimes just uh, stories in general uh, uh, that, that they can work Coca-Cola into. A simple example of media content for the world that reads just like any other media content that has some engaging power that you manage to try to attach to the brand. Now you can do that more indirectly uh, by, if you're, you're a mattress company, by simply offering people uh, utilitarian information about sleep. Uh, turns out that uh, lots of people don't sleep very well and uh, there's quite an appetite for any kind of media content that, that, that speaks to that in a, uh, in a self-help kind of, kind of mode. You can also do live events uh, where you, uh, in, again, inject uh, the brand into uh, media content. Uh, one of my favorite examples uh, this is the uh, Rivals Hall in the Copenhagen Airport. Uh, turns out that uh, uh, there's a custom in Denmark to greet people carrying a, uh, a Denmark flag uh, when they arrive back from a trip. And uh, Coca-Cola noticed that uh, the Denmark flag looks a, a lot like Coca-Cola and sort of a red and white motif. So they simply set up a display in the airport that you could pick up a, a flag if you didn't have one. And uh, you know, while this was a common thing, it wasn't you know, more than you know, a few people at any one time you would see doing this. But if you hand out the flags, then pretty soon everyone is doing this. And you see people having a moment of, of, of shared uh, social happiness, if you will, uh, with their Denmark flag. But very much associated with Coca-Cola being a part of the story. And of course, you can amplify the, the audience for that by simply turning it into a YouTube video and otherwise incorporating it into social media in various ways. And my argument is in the end, you have something that's very, very different from, from advertising. You have actually a piece of media content that people experience in a way that they experience media content in general and that they don't experience advertising in that way that uh, is very much a tool for building brand value. So to summarize this logic, uh, I sort of diagram it this way. What you're doing with content marketing, if you really step back and, and try to think about how it should work, is you're really using content to give people either actual or virtual experiences, either through live activations or, or actual media content, get people experiences that build um, what, what media content delivers, this sort of engagement that this is really relevant to your life and, and really deeper experiences that you, you, you really uh, find meaningful in life, what I refer to as the life goals and, and, and social values. 
the two being very intimately related and that most life goals come really from from social values uh, that you, you, you get culturally. Um, so given that perspective, what really is the key then to executing content marketing effectively? Short answer, storytelling. What all media content is about is storytelling and underneath the, 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 the engagement that any piece of media content has, it's the fact that stories are, are, are the way we have of really relating to life. Uh, stories have a deep kind of uh, embeddedness and in, in sort of human nature, if you will. You know, it's no accident that children play. They're really telling, telling stories to themselves as a way of growing up. It's no accident that you know, we watch four or five hours of TV a day. Um, uh, people are storytelling animals, and and there's a, really an infinite appetite for stories that really, uh, on the surface, might not seem very deep, but really are, and that any story really always involves tension, underlying conflict that's resolved. Uh, the best theory of of, of, of why stories are so pervasive is that we're really practicing uh, to uh, you know to deal with more things that we could ever actually experience in life. Uh, uh, so the key then uh, that I think is emerging from best practices to in, in with content marketing is really to make sure that you have a strong storyline that runs through your marketing efforts, that it's not a series of one-off content pieces, uh, but there's really an a overall uh, storyline. Coca-Cola, for example, uh, it, it calls this the uh, core thematic storyline. Uh, what you have here is sort of my paraphrase, but the, 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 the one that was actually used to guide their content marketing efforts is not much more elaborate. The world is a difficult place. It's hard to find time to connect with other people and share a social moment of happiness. And uh, the uh, Denmark airport example was just one piece of content marketing that tries to execute against that, that storyline to build sustained engagement with the Coca-Cola brand in that way. So I think we have time for one more bonus question. Um, does it work? Um, as I said, this is this is an evolving, if not revolutionary, kind of a change in, in marketing, and I don't really think we know the real answer. I, I've sort of given you a logical uh, reason that that for content marketing being an alternative to advertising. Uh, I don't know that we can yet prove uh, and compare uh, uh, content marketing uh, to anything else at this point. It is the case that uh, there have been some non-success stories. Uh, if you look at Coca-Cola the last couple of years, a uh, uh, very great period of content marketing before that, but, but then the CMO uh, uh, changed and uh, the new CMO went back to uh, advertising with a vengeance, uh, you know, taste the feeling, classic uh, 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 persuasion, benefit, advertising. Now that CMO just uh, exited in uh, uh, March or so, and there's a new person that's now the chief growth officer, and they're trying some new things and perhaps going back to content marketing. So it's it's very much we're feeling our way here in terms of uh, re really proven effectiveness. Uh, but I anticipate that the evidence will, will come. Um, in fact, I'll mention one more thing. Uh, Matt Isaacs and uh, Ed Malthouse and I have a little money from MSI and some other sources, and we're trying to do studies like the following, where we actually create a uh, essentially an online magazine and uh, uh, have various kinds of content, but uh, insert into that content uh, uh, some content marketing. So we actually sort of mimic the uh, Porsche example you see here, this is the real for our uh, uh, so-called uh, news website. 
and we actually uh, expose people to stories of this kind, uh, just like the one we started with. And uh, we have versions that are more or less engaging and, uh, and different versions of the kind of engagement. And we try to measure engagement directly. Um, the model we have is built really on sort of qualitative insights, trying to actually get people to tell us how they are uh, engaged with uh, specific pieces of content. So people will say things like this, which is sort of a community connection experience. And we can turn that into a actual measurement scale to try to get a more direct measure of engagement. And we do that with the, the kind of content I just showed you. And then we just do a, a typical sort of brand evaluation to see if the content uh, compared to a control or a less engaging source uh, really does uh, uh, change people's uh, attitude toward the brand. And we can relate that to changes uh, to the degree of engagement with the brand. So I think the evidence will come. Um, I, I can't say that there's really strong studies. There's, companies have a lot of data that people will, in fact, look at this type of um, uh, content. That's, that's not the issue. The issue is to really show that it, it, it really flows from the kind of engagement I'm talking about and really does translate into brand value. So uh, pretty much uh, is the time we have. Why don't we open it up to, to questions? Great. Uh, thanks very much, Bobby. Um, yeah, we've got a number of questions coming in, so keep keep sending them, and uh, I'll go through some of them. Um, <clears throat> one question that's come in is, are there guidelines for how to achieve effective content marketing? In other words, there's a whole set of books and, and frameworks around advertising and a whole industry around that. Is there something starting to emerge to approach that so people that want to apply it would, would be able to kind of consult some of the, the steps they would go through? Well, there's some, some books, uh, uh, things like Content Rules and uh, a variety of books that are more executional. Uh -huh. uh, they're more, more guides for people that are not sort of media content providers, uh, creators, uh, to go through the mechanics of creating content. But, um, uh, and that's not an unhelpful thing, but I don't think there's much in the way of more marketing-oriented uh, guidebooks for, uh, for actually uh, creating content uh, that that really involves a brand and in, in, in sort of uh, proven ways. Uh, even things like, uh, which is something we're working on, how do you identify this content unless you you, you don't identify it at all, uh, but uh, if you identify it as sponsored content or branded content or uh, content from the brand, uh, uh, even questions as, as, as basic as that, uh, I don't know that we really know enough yet to, to really have specific guidelines on. So we're at the early stages of it, and as you point out, some of the research that you're doing and uh, MS, MSI is involved in some of it, trying to develop some of those uh, understandings, metrics, and ultimately that could lead to guidelines, but we're, we're still in a pretty early stage, I think you're saying about that. Yeah, I, I think that's the case, and, and even some very fundamental questions. Uh, for example, what is the impact of this on actual content media? Uh, you know, you got the New York Times with the T Studio in this business of creating content for brands. What does that do to the New York Times brand itself? And uh, you know, even even things as basic as that are, are sort of up for grabs at this point. You know, one question related to that uh, was asked about, do we know how it impacts loyal versus non-loyal customers? You know, do we, do we have a starting to get any understanding of, of why, how it might be relevant to different segments of uh, consumers in different ways? 
Yeah, interesting question. Um, we know with advertising that people tend to look at ads that uh, they're already favorable to, uh, and even even brands that they already use, uh, they're more sensitive, more likely to look at that advertising. Um, uh, I don't think we know. It would be a very interesting question whether content marketing is – as uh, uh, is more or less powerful with uh, people that are not really uh, um, uh, uh, favorable to the brand or, or, or you know, even aware of the brand. Uh, uh, again, another interesting question that I yeah. don't think we have the answer to. And maybe it's a different relationship to people who respond adversely or, or you know, don't like advertising in some way or another or skip it. You mentioned a bunch of factors, uh, you know, in the ad, ad world of ads being, you know, a certain amount of waste in there. So maybe they're different. Well, you know, every CEO, CEO will tell you, uh, you don't have to talk to any CEO about marketing uh, for very long, and they will always say, you know, I think 50% of my advertising is wasted, but you know, I don't dare uh, – uh, cut back. Uh, um, advertising is a very inefficient thing. Um, and, you know, uh, most TV ads are seen by uh, a few people many, many, many times. Uh, so uh, there's a real question here of uh, 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 more the negative side of advertising. I don't want to yeah say that advertising is, you know, is history or anything like that, uh, although people, some people say that, but uh, I, I think uh, there's a potential here for, for really solving uh, not only uh, going beyond advertising, but really getting around some of the problems that have always existed with advertising. Right. So it's interesting. Um, questions come up in a couple of different ways is about B2B. Uh, your focus in a lot of what you said are consumer markets, but a uh, question is really, does this apply or how does it apply? Uh, how would you change it if you were thinking about a B2B marketing situation? Well, you know, in some ways, B2B has always been ahead of the, the, the curve here because uh, obviously thought leadership has always been a notion that um, – uh, it, that's been very salient to B&B companies, um, usually translated more into a PR kind of mode. But, uh, you know, if you look at uh, uh, General Electric or uh, um, companies like that, you see them really embracing content marketing. Even, you know, even Watson and IBM is uh, in part a, 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 not only a – an actual service, uh, it's, it's a content marketing effort. You know, when you have Watson on Jeopardy and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I, I think B&B, &B, um, this approach um, is, is a natural fit. You know, if you look at, a, say, a professional services firm, you know, they've always done, um, you know, uh, uh, seminars and, you know, these days, you, you've got email newsletters and so forth. It's a very small step to say, let's turn around and think about that uh, as not so directly um, selling, but to uh, as really being in the content media business of providing people with valuable information. In some cases, that's literally articles, right? To tech companies in particular, I'm not sure if Watson is doing that now, but uh, putting out technical information, points of view. Yeah, absolutely. And again, business, but, yeah. backing off, having it be directly sales-oriented and doing it more for uh, informational value, engaging in customers' own questions rather than just questions about the product. Yeah. Um, one question was about, you know, do you, how strong a sense of the brand purpose do you need to make this work? And it, it sort of suggests to me maybe there's a broader question of are there situations where you would steer clear of it or where you think it doesn't work? But maybe you could comment on both of those. You know, what's, what's the uh, uh, 
the, how important is it to have a really clear vision of what the brand is doing? And do you ever find yourself in a situation where you just say, let's, let's look elsewhere for, for a brand building activity? Well, I, I'm sure there, there's sort of the landmine situations. Um, um, it, you know, the, I think that the basic thing to think about would be, is there any reason for, for is, is there content that's sensitive to some people um, in some way that would cause them to resent the connection of a brand to that content? Um, you know, if it's... Uh, if you were, and many people accuse the Coca-Cola content marketing of virgin on that, uh, you know, things like um, uh, building a, uh, putting a Coke machine in uh, Lahore uh, and, and one in uh, Delhi and having people in shopping centers interact with each other across the, 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 the Pakistan-India uh, border. Um, it was a nice thought on the face of it, but maybe uh, maybe backfired a little bit. Uh, it was too thought to be too preachy at the very least, and maybe a little insensitive to the to the real political situation. So yeah, I, I think there are those kinds of pitfalls, but uh, people seem to be pretty open to this. Uh, and the, you would think the biggest danger would be that they simply say, oh, this is just another way of, of, of trying to sell me, uh, which is somewhat disingenuous, but uh, uh, there doesn't seem to be that reaction yet. Interesting. Now, you mentioned, uh, I think you put out a number for advertising somewhere in the trillion-dollar range. Is there a way to size the content marketing business today, or is that still, are we still at too early of a stage to really be able to classify it? Yeah, I haven't uh, I haven't seen any numbers that make uh, too much sense of the scope. Uh, it's the kind of thing I was alluding to that this gets buried as a line item in overall budgets and really isn't considered uh, uh, sort of a, a major way of doing marketing. Um, so it would be really hard, I think, given that to really come up with an aggregate number. But the way I like to think about size, and the reason I mentioned the, 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 the total advertising expenditure, which nobody knows, but you know, it's got to be somewhere north of $600 million to over a trillion. Um, it's a huge sum of money. And to the extent that you embrace the fact that marketing really does have to explore alternatives to that, uh, there's a huge pot of money uh, sitting there to be deployed if, uh, if, if companies become increasingly convinced that there is a sea change here from classic advertising to uh, content marketing of the, the sort I'm describing. Yeah. Um, it, one question came up about uh, sort of relating this to user uh, or consumer generated content, is content marketing mainly consumer generated and marketers build on it or, uh, you know, is it really mostly company initiated or both? I guess the broader issue there may be does the, you know, growth of consumer, of consumer generated media or social media in the last five, ten years have something to do with this one way or the other? You know, maybe it's correlated with it, maybe it's causing it, maybe it's well, the way I like to th the way I like to think about that is uh, it, to take the perspective that um, what we're talking about here is media, and it's not it's 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 not social media or what about Facebook that that kind of uh, orientation. Media is media, and it's the case that uh, user interact interactivity is becoming more and more prevalent across media. And so that's just a feature of, of media content and, and the nature of it these days increasingly. So you know, most people get their news on, indirectly from Facebook uh, uh, rather than you know, reading the uh, newspaper directly, that kind of thing. So uh, sure, uh, 
user generated is more and more important because it's more and more important to the way media content is done and and that's the way it comes into content marketing not by saying look uh, there's consumers out there that are anxious to uh, to to write content about your brand uh, people are any, any kind of content people are oriented to participating in with it interactively if it's really going to be engaging for them uh, this is sort of now getting into some uh, some issues that are that are current in the uh, the media world today maybe at, not, not as much in products but in the news that we're all consuming we had one question about fake news and I, I don't want to go down a deep, uh, you know, investigation of that, but can, can you help us sort of frame that? Like, how do you think about the role of fake news in, in today's world? Does it relate at all to what, what we're getting at here with content? Well, anytime you produce content, you run the danger of, of, of fake news, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, the the National Enquirer is engaging as it can be for its audience, but you know it's largely totally fake news, right? So presumably you could do the same thing with uh, with content marketing. Now, you know there are all kinds of ethical issues here, but uh, um, you know fake fake news is a part and parcel of being in the media business and. Right. What I'm saying is if you're doing content marketing, you have to think of being in the media business, and fake news becomes you know, one of the, the issues, uh, uh, not something you know, from a journalism school perspective you'd want to encourage, but uh, it, it could be done. Yeah. So it's, it's something that perhaps there's you know, this kind of discussion and this influence in marketing will lead to more uh, – you know, examination of that phenomenon, maybe maybe even some, uh, you know, more rigorous research on what it actually is and isn't. Um, well, and, and what it says, too, is that beyond fake news, uh, there's the question of, uh, of people essentially using content marketing to, to, uh, to uh, insert themselves into uh, conventional mainstream media, which in, in the past has been more impervious to being infiltrated, if you will, or used uh, so that uh, if the media are, are covering something and uh, um, the brand becomes a story, uh, you, you, uh, you run the risk there of uh, compromising the, uh, the uh, integrity of the news. I'm trying to steer away from saying anything political, but uh, yeah, uh, there is that. Interesting. Well, um, we're getting close to the end of our time. Uh, Bobby, any other comments you'd like to make? I know you know you've seen a number of these questions come in, but do you think there's any uh, perspectives you want to share that that maybe we didn't quite get to? Well, what I'd like people to think about and maybe give some feedback on is uh, yeah, my point is that we're not dealing here with another uh, uh, hype uh, uh, you know, of the day, of the, of the year uh, type of marketing uh, activity. Uh, uh, this really even transcends social media. Social media is just media. And what's going on here is a major way of rethinking how marketing is done, switching from a persuasion model and being largely independent of media except for using media for attention gathering purposes to really, really using content, um, the power of content um, very directly for the, the, the basic uh, goal of marketing, which is building brand value. Yeah, I, I think you've, you've definitely helped us uh, sort of think that through. And if other if people have more questions or comments on that, you know, we, we'd certainly be open to receiving that feedback and keeping, uh, you know, and feeding back to you and, and discussing this further. Um, so that's been a great presentation. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks very much. Um,
you can reach out to Bobby directly at, at his email address. Um, and it, we can, I think that's in the first page of the presentation. And uh, with that, I want to thank you and just let you know that our next webinar in this series will be on five vital drivers of brand success, lessons from the Brand Z Top 100 Most Valuable Global Brands uh, with Doreen Wang on August 22nd, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, many thanks to uh, members of the MSI audience here today for participating in this member-to-member -member webinar series, and again, thanks to, thanks to uh, Bobby.